Hunting boots are a critical component of any successful hunt. Whether walking a short distance to your blind or trudging miles through rugged terrain, your feet are carrying the load. Without the right boots, you could give up early and lose out on that trophy just over the ridge. At Midway USA, we make selecting boots for your next hunt easier. With just a few clicks of a mouse, you can decide on what's important, like waterproofing, insulation, size, width, and savings. For just about everything for shooting, hunting, and the outdoors, check out MidwayUSA.com. Midway USA brand product designers have one straightforward goal. Develop high-quality, technically sound products and deliver them to customers at reasonable prices. If you are immersed in the shooting sports industry and pay close attention to every single detail, you know our products are built right and stand up to everyday use. Who has shooting mats and range bag systems to hunting clothing and just about everything for the outdoors? Log on and shop. 24-7 with super fast shipping. MidwayUSA.com Welcome to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. I'm Matthew of castingacross.com, where I explore the quarry and culture of fly fishing. This is episode 152, 152. Thank you for being a part of Casting Across Fly Fishing. I do this for me, but I also do this for you. So it's good to have a you to do this for. Today we're going to talk about fighting fish. So a couple of months ago, I did a fish fighting podcast. Um, and that was actually brought on by a listener request. Um, the, the, this listener requested that we talk about fighting fish on the podcast because in their opinion, and I think rightfully so, it's one of those things that is kind of an assumption. Like everyone knows how to fight a fish properly. Well, the fact of the matter is that's not true. It's not good to make assumptions and it's not good to think that the only hard part of fishing is casting or the only difficult part of fly fishing is figuring out what fly to use. There are some significant skill points of emphasis within fighting fish and they're worth talking about. So in that last episode, which I admitted as I was I was recording it, that is probably going to be one of two or one of a series on things to think about when fighting fish. I talked about some stuff that's maybe a little bit on the periphery of the normal conversation about what it means to fight a fish well. I talked about your positioning. I talked about how to move the fish's head. Um, I talked about anticipating fighting a fish. Uh, when you are even getting into your approach and your presentation. And today we're going to continue that theme by talking about a few other kind of aspects of fish fighting that are maybe common sense to you, and you might want to just kind of go through it real quickly just to remind yourself, or they might be things that you haven't thought of. But again, as I usually say, you know, if this is something that you know, uh, hearing me say it could be helpful in the sense that now you have words to articulate it uh, when you are talking about it with fishing with somebody else. If you have a child that you're getting into fishing or a friend that you're getting into fishing or you actually have some kind of instructor capacity in your local trout and limited chapter, then maybe some of the words that I use can be helpful for you as you think about it or even just as you're refining how you do it yourself. And the first thing, uh, which was spurred on by an Instagram post, um, so I don't get on social media as much as I used to, and I mentioned this in a podcast recently, but there's a handful of, of folks I follow. I don't follow a lot of people on Instagram, uh, but there is a brand I was following, and they had a picture of someone fighting a fish. It was a large fish. It was probably a salmon or a steelhead, and they were a good 15 feet, maybe almost uh, like 10 yards uh, back off of the edge of the water as they were fighting a fish, and somebody was netting that fish for them in the water. Obviously, that's where you net fish, and any self-respecting fly fishing company isn't going to have the picture of one of their ambassadors or even any photograph in general of somebody pulling a fish across the rocks. And it got me thinking, that looks weird. It's not a normal scene, but it's a normal thing to do, and I've done it, and there's a chance that you've done it. Why back so far away from the water, from the fish, as you're fighting the fish? And there's a few reasons for that. And the primary one is that you are angling, right? That's what fishing is. Fly fishing, conventional tackle fishing, you name it. It's angling. You are using a rod and line to create an angle between you and the fish. And in doing so, you are applying force and you are applying tension on that fish such that you're able to reel it in without compromising the more delicate 
elements of the equation, most notably your tippet. And so that's how it's an angle. So why would this conversation include backing up? Well, think about being on a river and you have a hard fighting fish and maybe a strong current and you are standing on the edge of that river. If you catch that fish in the middle of that stream and maybe reel it in 30, 20 feet close to you and now it's swimming around at your feet, you have lost that angle. That angle has gone too acute and it is very difficult to manage where that fish is, especially if it's a hard fighting fish like a big trout or salmon or steelhead or something with teeth. The last thing you want is to get into a situation where that rod, you, you don't have an angle anymore, and it's kind of flopping back and forth. I think we've all had that experience where, you know, imagine holding your rod completely upright, and instead of that rod bending and absorbing the load of that fish pulling at it, it's kind of just flopping back and forth um, from your left to your right or in front of you to behind you because that fish is moving at uh, a, a such a tight angle underneath your feet. So obviously there's problems because one, the fish is maybe running circles around you. Secondly, you're not applying any force and tiring a fish out so that you can get it to net and either, you know, capture your fish or release it without having it exert more energy than it needs to involves applying pressure and controlling that fish. Fighting a fish means controlling a fish whether you're going to keep it or you're going to release it. You're all about control so that you can get that fish to you as soon as possible without, again, compromising your gear. So what does it have to do with backing up, being on the land? Well, if that water is fast and that fish is hard fighting and you back up, you are now opening up that angle and it's becoming less acute and you are able to still apply that pressure. So you're further away from the fish, absolutely. But this allows you to do a few things. One, if that fish still has a lot of fight in it, by backing up, you're able to exert a little bit more pressure and get it to the point where you can net it safely yourself. Now, if you have somebody with you, you can back up and maintain that strong angle um, maintaining, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give it a degree number, but it's certainly not anything acute. Uh, it's, it's going to be a, at an angle where that you can still apply pressure on that fish's head and move it where you want to move it and get it close to where your, your friend or your angling companion can net it. But that's what you're looking to do. Now, if you're by yourself, again, what it comes down to is just applying enough energy and force on that fish's head to get it to a place where you can safely release it, where you can safely net it, uh, where, where you can get that fish to you without it thrashing around and damaging your tippet or thrashing around and running circles around you and you know causing causing you to, to lose that fish because it's it's popped the fly or it's because it's run into you or it's uh, the line's gone slack because it's um, not a, you're not able to maintain the same amount of tension when it is a really really tight acute um, angle between you and that fish you know that that fish might be a foot in front of you but it's uh, nine feet of rod uh, straight up and then you know maybe 12 or 13 feet of tippet straight down and that's just not an easy way to control that fish if you do get in that situation uh, my encouragement is to not have that rod straight up and down pull that rod off to the side and be ready to move it you know laterally away from your body so if you can picture that fish, it's kind of at your feet. You've gotten yourself in a bad situation. Great, you've caught the fish. You've caught a decent-sized fish that's got a good fight in it, but you're not in a great location, and you're really close to that fish. At that point, I drop that rod down and pull it away from, from my, my body. So I have my arm extended, um, and now I'm able to apply a little bit of leverage to that fish and maybe move it to... Uh, my left or my right and get to a position where I can open that angle up maybe as I take a step back. So this is a great way to do this is if you're on the beach. I do this when I'm fighting stripers. I will get to where I can get into a shallower spot um, where maybe I can get to a, a higher spot where I can get up on a rock. Um, do this again for salmon and steelhead. This is a great way to fight a larger fish. Again, you want to be careful for, for any of these fish that you're not having them smash themselves up against the rocks, but you can back up so you can maintain that angle and that leverage. Um, I've even done this in trout streams where the water is really deep. So maybe I am up against the stream bank, but uh, the, the water is deep around me. I will walk back or walk over or walk onto a gravel bar or the bank and take a few steps back so I'm able to maintain 
that angle while that fish still has a lot of juice in it so that I'm not tiring it out needlessly and I'm also not going to lose it because it's running circles around my feet. Again, you are going to be at your best when you maintain the best angles with between you and the fish. And that can be done simply by relocating where your feet are to open that angle up a little bit more. As I alluded to last week, we have a new sponsor for the podcast, and that sponsor is XChair. We've all transitioned in the last year and a half to how we work and where we work. And there's a good chance that if you're working from home, you're sitting on something ridiculous. You might be sitting at a kitchen table chair. You might be sitting in a lounge chair. You might be sitting in a camp chair that you've brought and put somewhere in your house. And there's a good chance that your back is not feeling so great. Well, I don't have that problem because I am sitting in an X chair. Because can your office chair or your kitchen chair or your camp chair, can it heat up or cool down? My X chair can. Can your uh, lounge chair massage? My X chair can. And once you feel the customized support of X chair and their patented dynamic variable lumbar or DVL, uh, your back will never be happy in any other chair again. Uh, there are so many points of customization on my X chair. I absolutely love it. It fits perfectly at my desk. It for, feels great as I recline to read. You can actually lock the recline function or you can rock back and forth. It is a fantastic chair to work in. It's a fantastic chair to read in. And I love the fact that I have the option if I want to of hitting a button and getting a little bit of warmth or cool or even a little bit of massage. And so I would absolutely encourage you to check out the X chair, talk to your office manager if it's that time of equipping the offices for some new equipment. And you can find out so much more by going to xchaircasting.com. And once you get there and you get a chair, you can try X chair for yourself risk-free for 30 days. So go to xchaircasting.com now. That's the letter X chair c-a-s-t-i-n-g dot com or call 1-844-4-X-CHAIR for $100 off your order. X-CHAIR has a 30-day guarantee of complete comfort and you can finance your purchase for as little as $30 a month. xchaircasting.com Now on to the second fish fighting piece of advice for you. Use your drag. Use it well. Now, a lot of times, drag is simply the mechanism that controls the tension with which you apply as you strip line off so that you can cast. For most situations, that is how a drag is used. A lot of fish don't require the, the employment of drag for you to fight them. You're able to do so with the line that you have out. You're able to get them on the reel quickly. And just applying that angle and the flex in your rod and the, the inherent flex and fly line, you're able to fight a fish without having it pull out a lot of line. Now, if you catch lots of big fish, then I apologize. I know you use your drag all the time. But for most people in most situations, they're not tinkering with their drag more than how much drag do I need to establish so that I can strip line off easy without causing it to free spool? So again, what's drag? Let's define our terms. The drag is the mechanism that is used to apply pressure to your spool within your reel that determines the energy required to pull line off of your reel. So as what I was saying earlier is that Usually, line coming off of the spool of your reel is being done as you're stripping out to prepare to cast or you're stripping out line as you're hauling to, to cast more line out. But ideally, it's also going to be coming off because you've hooked such a large fish that all the line that you had out of your reel and through the guides of your rod and out the tip of your rod, that has been made tight by that fish. And because it is running and it is so strong and large, it's pulling more line off of your reel. So what we need to establish is that the line doesn't come off so easily that just by casting, line's coming off. If that's happening, by the way, if you're casting and you hear click, 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 click with every forward and backward motion of your cast because a little bit of line's coming off, then you need to tighten that drag down just a little bit. Um, if you are casting and you're stripping line off to make another cast and it goes into free spool, so it keeps spinning, it doesn't stop when you stop applying uh, pressure pulling line out, then that means that you need to tighten it up also. Um, but 
if it is a lot of effort and you actually your your cast gets messed up because as you are making your casting motion and you go to pull line out it's actually pulling the reel because there's so much tension you might get you know a foot or two feet of line but your reel gets tugged a couple of inches that's going to cause your cast to be bad but if there's that much tension there's a good chance that when that fish hits and that fish runs that it's going to snap your your line. It's going to snap, not your line, but your tippet. It's going to break one of your knots because that's quite a bit of force being applied laterally, usually laterally in your spool. I mean, different, different drag mechanisms apply force in different ways. But you want to make sure that your drag is configured such that you can cast, strip, and then also fight fish well. All three of those things. And I wouldn't say that one is more important than the other. And I would actually say that fighting fish needs to be the lowest priority in where your drag is set. Because, again, you're going to be casting and stripping a lot more than you're going to be fighting fish on your reel. Again, I'm sorry if you catch tons of big fish and this makes no sense to you because you're always fighting fish on the drag. But where you need to do is as that fish is running... If you get onto a fish and it is pulling a lot of line out, you have two options. One is to palm your spool. And hopefully you know what that means. But basically, instead of messing with the mechanism of, of your drag, which if you're a right-handed caster, there's a good chance that that mechanism, there's probably a 100% chance, that the mechanism for controlling that drag is on the right side of your reel. So you'd have to reach around with your left hand or switch hands and then and then use your right hand to apply or take away some of that tension using the drag mechanism. It's incredibly cumbersome. So I would say palm your reel in that situation. So using your left hand, your your reeling hand, your off hand, if you are a right-handed caster, all you gotta do is apply a little bit of, of gentle force distributed from maybe fingertip down your finger across your palm to the, the, the heel of your hand. Apply that to that open spool, making sure you're keeping your thumb and your fingers away from that spinning reel knob. Uh, you don't want to get whacked by that, especially if it's a really powerful fish that will, A, cause a hiccup in the whole procedure, and you might lose that fish because it hits a, a jolts against the stop real quick, but also it could, you know, tear up your, your knuckles. If you've ever had that happen before, it's, it's a thrill, but it's also not particularly fun. But if you're having to do that all the time, then that also shows that maybe your drag is not set where it should be. It means that you're going to have to apply a little bit more pressure. Now, this is where I like to have reels with a big easy to grab drag knob i mentioned this in a article recently where i like reddington's reels uh the behemoth and the grande in particular because they have huge drag knobs that are easy to grab where i've had it happen before where on a behemoth reel i have a fish on that's running and all i have to do is turn my reel so instead of being um, perpendicular with the water it's parallel with the water i'm still able to maintain that angle with the fish that's running but now i can reach up underneath grab that huge drag knob i'm not going to get my fingers stuck anywhere and add a, just a couple of clicks of of modification of that drag and now i have tension but that's something to be aware of if your fish are running and running and running and they are just having a field day and you love the sound of that reel spinning that's probably not the best fight for that fish. Every once in a while, if your gear is right, you know, you're fishing uh, for, for big trout and you have a six weight uh, and every fish is running you to your backing, you probably need to figure out a way to apply a little bit more drag. Um, if you're fishing for stripers with a eight weight or a nine weight and every fish is running you out to your backing, uh, but they're normal size fish, they're schoolies, you know, they're, they're 18, 20, 22 inches. Um, then you probably uh, need to apply a little bit more drag. And this is going to do a, a couple of things. One, it's better for the fish. You're not going to exhaust it. Um, and secondly, you are going to be able to fight that fish more efficiently. Having a fish far away is not ideal. A fish that jumps far away is not ideal for maintaining a good um, thing hooked up to that fish. Um, a fish that's far away that has access to things like rocks and roots and banks is not a great situation. Now, if that's the only way you can catch that fish, then that's great. But don't afford that fish another opportunity. I've had fish I've lost because they've run downstream too far on me. And now they're over this waterfall and over that waterfall. And they're into really, really fast water. And I have a, so much line out that there's 
nothing I can do. If they if they run out 50 or 60 feet from you, and then they come back towards you a few feet, how are you going to quickly um, accommodate that slack in that line if you uh, have, have let that fish run run so far away from you? So from a selfish perspective, it's not a great way to stay hooked up with a fish, and it really reduces your chances of landing that fish and playing it properly if it is far away from you. And from the fish's perspective, from a more environmental stewardship um, way to look at things, it's not great for that fish for it to be stressed out longer than it needs to be. Um, we, let's not, you know, mince words here. We, we're stressing fish out. It is what it is, but I think we can safely and responsibly play fish and get them to hand um, without adding undue stress to them. And you can do that by having the right drag setting. Make that fish work. Make sure that it is tiring itself out. Um, it's fun to play a fish. It's fun to feel that thing throbbing at the end of your, your line. But at the end of the day, you don't want to experience that in spite of the fish. You don't want to experience that where the fish is suffering uh, because of it. It's one thing to stress a fish out. I mean, it doesn't want to be hooked. So that's what's stressing it out. It's not the same kind of pain that people feel. It's not the same kind of stress that people feel. But it is just that that flight mechanism has been put into play. And you want to limit that or reduce that as much as possible. And you can do that by making sure your drag is in a good place prior to hooking that fish and then being very, very careful to make those modifications afterwards. All right, so really that's only kind of two big chunks of advice, but things that, that might sound very simple, and for you this is like totally common sense, but maybe you can employ them in one way or another, or you could pass that on to somebody who's losing fish or probably you know uh, getting fish running around their ankles, like I said earlier, or uh, they let fish run out 50, 60, 70 feet before they start reeling it in. Those are both not great situations for you or for the fish. Uh, you don't look like a particularly seasoned angler if someone <laughs> sees you doing that. And uh, it's just a way that you can improve your fish fighting. Any other questions about fish fighting? Any any specifics? Let me know. Matthew at castingacross.com. I've got a couple more in the hopper, but these two seem like they warranted a, a podcast adding to that first fish fighting podcast, which again, you can look back in the archives and find that one relatively easy on castingacross.com or your favorite podcast app. This week on castingacross.com, I put out a video. I know I said I'd be doing more videos and I'm not doing lots of them, but I did do one and this one was called video fly fishing's controversial gear fly fishing's controversial gear nippers people have such strong opinions on nippers it's ridiculous that you would spend fifteen dollars on a pair of fingernail clippers well the reality is there's pairs of nippers that go for close to 150 dollars and there's some that fall in between and they fit your hand better they kind of do what you want them to do and at the end of the day, we shouldn't get that upset with what people spend on a piece of fly fishing gear. So in this video, I kind of touch on that and add a little bit of scolding to people who judge and scold others for what they buy. But I also talk about why different nippers might fit your needs better. Very general, very kind of big picture, but I walk through, I think, six different options. And uh, just to kind of give you a hint, I'm not a huge nail clipper fan. I like a good pair of nippers, but I'm also very content with just a well-built, solid pair of $15 and $20 nippers that have the right features for a fly fisher. The second article this week is called Six P's for Taking Somebody Fly Fishing. Actually, Six P's for Taking Someone Fly Fishing. So using alliteration, I have three steps for keeping it simple. Three steps for keeping fly fishing instruction simple. What to major on, what to minor on, what to focus on, what not to worry about on. And because a lot of us like like to accumulate fly fishing knowledge and know-how and basically trivia. But that's not what most people want when they are going fishing for the first time. They don't want to know how to shadow cast like Brad Pitt in River Runs Through It. They don't need to know all the Latin names of every mayfly that you come across. They want to get a fish on the line. So how can you help them do that without also doing bad things? You know, you, you, you don't want to set them up for failure when they do want to go deeper. But you also don't want to go too deep such that they are learning how to fly fish but not actually fishing if that is why they're going. So I talk about a few simple things. 
on that article on castingacross.com. This week's recommendation on the podcast are Orvis shirts. Now, hear me out. I've talked about a few different Orvis shirts. I love their pro dry release long sleeve shirts. One of my favorite shirts for just wearing around, but also for fishing because they dry quickly and they're comfortable. Uh, This time of year, this is being recorded in October. This is the time of year to get deals on shirts that you might think are much, much too expensive under normal circumstances. I'm talking, I'm looking at a $100 shirt. I'm looking at a $90 shirt on their website right now. I'm looking at a $60 shirt. These are long sleeve button up shirts that could be worn on the river, but could also be worn to the office or be worn out for dinner after either of those activities. And they're down to like $40, $50, even cheaper than that, which is the price of a long sleeve button up shirt. But in these, you get some features. And it's not always the back flap that you're used to seeing in casting shirts. It's always a collar that rolls up two or three times or buttons on the, on the, the bicep so you can roll up your sleeves. It's things like a mesh back, uh, things like extra pockets. Um, it's it's uh, maybe a little subtle vent in the armpit. Um, It's wrinkle resistant, which is worth its weight in gold. So I think these shirts are really comfortable. I have a couple. I actually wore one to work today. Um, It's the, I think the open air plaid caster, which is a hundred dollar shirt if you just buy it, but I didn't buy mine that way. It was on sale. Uh, Right now I'm looking at $41 and 40 cents. The sizes are probably limited. The colors are probably limited, but if you get onto Orvis's website, you can browse all of their shirts. They have new stuff that's probably coming out this winter time. So now is the opportunity to get a really, really well-made shirt, really, really comfortable shirt at a great price price. So again, just head over to Orvis's website. You can check them out there. If you live by one of the stores, I'm sure they have a sale rack, but uh, I don't advocate somebody going out and spending $100 on a long sleeve shirt, but $40 for a $100 shirt, I think that's well worth it uh, if, if you can find something that fits you well and that's comfortable for you. I'll put a link to Orvis, if you ever heard of it, orvis.com, on the show notes for this podcast page on castingacross.com. Thanks for listening to the Casting Across Fly Fishing Podcast. Please subscribe to your favorite podcast app and rate the podcast on iTunes. Then head over to castingacross.com for three posts a week on the people, places, and things that go into the pursuit of fish. life that has the stories to back it a life to be proud of it's a winchester life yeah baby six eight western oh, i'll be over there baby right there tune in every tuesday at 7 p.m eastern on waypoint tv in wild country rules were not created by man don't miss wild country wednesdays from 7 to 11 p.m eastern presented by primos speak the language waypoint tv the destination for outdoor entertainment